Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, I hope my voice is audible enough. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, maybe one of us can please lead in prayer. Amen. Zeli. Yeah, go ahead. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, I come before your presence in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for this brand new day, Lord. As we begin our session to the Lord, Holy Spirit, you guide us, you bless our pastor with your wisdom, your insight, your revelation, so that Lord Jesus, she, he will be able to teach the word according to your will and bless each one of us, Lord, help us so that we can understand, Lord, uh, uh, the word which has been uh, uh, taught by uh, pastor, Lord God. Bless each one of us, and also we pray for good network connection so that there will be no hindrances in our class, Lord. We thank you, we bless you, we honor you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Zeli. Thank you. All right. So uh, we've been talking about the ministry of the teacher. We started off with chapter 6, where we saw Jesus as our example, uh, as a teacher. We looked at how he ministered. Uh, to the people that he met with, that he, the thousands of people that came to hear him, uh, he also taught them before he could do those signs, miracles, and wonders. And then chapter 7, we saw the teacher in the early church, how uh, the ministry of the teacher, even after Jesus' resurrection, uh, when we look at the book of Acts, and then how uh, teachers were raised up in Jerusalem, Antioch, Samaria, going on to different parts of uh, even Asia Minor. The Apostle Paul did a lot of, uh, you know, this this teaching and raising up of leaders. Uh, and I'm sure everywhere that he went in his missionary journey, he was able to raise up uh, teachers and, uh, uh, you know, so that the word of God would be taught to people. And then we went to chapter 8. We saw the restoration of the ministry of the teacher. Uh, so after the book of Acts, there was... Um, a season called the Dark Ages. Uh, and when you look at history, there was absolutely no kind of teaching, no uh, preaching also. Uh, there was no ministry of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, everything had just come down to uh, a very religious system set in place. And uh, But after that, the Lord you know, used many people, many great men and women of God who, um, you know, came and began to teach the word of God, the importance of God's word to be, uh, you know, interpreted in the right way. Uh, schools of uh, Bible colleges, seminaries were started during the early, I would say, 1900s. Uh, you know, these seminaries and Bible colleges, which even continue now as well. So, uh, so. Today, we look at chapter 9, and um, chapter 9 is practical keys to doing the ministry of the teacher. So yesterday, we also, sorry, not yesterday, but last week, we talked, we also discussed on, you know, all of us had a lot of questions, and we discussed on how, uh, you know, how we can be effective teachers, and, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we may face, right? Teaching is, uh, I would say, teaching is, a little more difficult than preaching, right? Because uh, teaching involves a lot of uh, lots and lots of preparation. It involves digging deep and research and all of these things. So, uh, so we looked at some of the challenges as well. So we'll move to chapter nine. What are the practical keys to doing the ministry of the teacher? Right now, all of us we've established the fact that teaching is for all of us. Right. It, it is not, right. we talked about that in chapter one, right? The ministry function and the ministry gift, right? So we all will get an opportunity, right, to present the gospel. And it could be even a three minute or a four minute, uh, you know, just to, just to, you know, probably uh, explain a verse, right? Just explaining a simple verse. Uh, you're doing the ministry of a teacher, right? Now, when I say, when we say teacher, it's it's not like you will only, you, you know, have the setting of, okay, 100 people sitting in a classroom, you're standing there. If that happens, that's good. Uh, but even if it's in a smaller setting, 
uh, each one of us can do the ministry of a teacher. Here's the first point. Develop a passion for knowledge. All right, let's read that uh, verse. Matthew 13 and 52. Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. Yes, any one of us can please read. Matthew 15 and sorry, Matthew 13 and verse 52. Matthew 13, 52, then he said to them, Therefore, every scrap instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Yeah, thank you so much, Zeli. Uh, so it is, it is some, uh, you know, it says there, who brings out the treasures both new and old. Right now, without a passion for knowledge, right, uh, it's very difficult for us to be effective teachers. Right? Now, I like that word passion. Right? Passion is something that you know we have in, instilled already in us. Or passion can also be developed. Right now, it says here, develop a passion for knowledge. So, if you're already passionate about knowledge, you're one step ahead. Right. Now, how do I develop a passion for knowledge? How do I, you know, oh, if I want to be a teacher, what, what should I do to develop knowledge, to get knowledge, right? It's obvious, right? We need to be researchers, good readers, right? We, we need to be interested in reading material, things that are happening, right? Now, uh, uh, it, it involves a lot of dedication, a lot of time, a uh, lot of preparation. Right. So, for example, if I'm uh, if I'm teaching about you know example, right, uh, uh, take a topic that is little you know involves a lot of research. So, end times eschatology, right. So, for example, I'm teaching that now. If I don't have a passion to you know to bring out the study of end times, what will happen is I can just follow notes and uh, deliver the uh, you know the teaching and you know. Uh, just go on with whatever is there. Uh, but that's not the point of a teacher. We must develop a passion for knowledge. So what must we do? Okay, go back, read history, right? Go back and see what from the scriptures. What does God say? Okay, these are churches, right? God is talking, the Lord Jesus is talking to these churches. Then he's talking about all these different things. So how can I relate to it? So maybe I can go to commentaries, go to, um, you know, uh, uh, different Bible study that is available online, right? And, and read about it, right? What do these writers say? Look up uh, theologians. What is their understanding uh, about this whole thing? And, you know, there are different kinds of... Uh, you know, uh, beliefs right now, right? Some believe in pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, mid-tribulation. What about the rapture? So we got to, you know, the, the Bible is our standard, but we must be able to dig in deeper, right? And if I'm, if I'm doing something like, you know, uh, if I'm studying eschatology or I'm going to teach it, I will definitely look up geography, right? I will definitely look up world events that have happened over the last 10 years and what are the world events that may uh, you know uh, may be for the next 10 years i will definitely look into that it's something very interesting i know i'm going off uh, our course here but this is something very interesting i was reading about uh, israel as a nation and uh, what their plans to do and it was really really interesting to see that israel is in talks with um, now the the leaders of the Muslim faith to buy the land uh, where the the dome is, right? And we know that's that's so important because uh, you know it, it, there's come a time when the Muslims are willing to sell that plot. Now, for those who want a context, that that plot is David's land, David's 
plot and uh, uh, that land. And apparently, Muhammad had a vision in that place, and they built uh, a mosque or a dome-like uh, structure. The Muslims have built that, and and, and so. Uh, the Jews are willing to pay how much ever it is required because for them it's a holy land. It's it's something that belongs to their ancestors, King David. So right now, they are in talks to buy it. And if they buy it, tell me what is going to happen. Like everything becomes so in you know close, and you're able to relate these things. This is a world event. But if I don't know why is it important in the scriptures? I will not be able to effectively communicate that. Like we know that the temple is going to be rebuilt there. The Lord Jesus, when he comes uh, after the battle of Armageddon, he'll come, he'll sit in that temple. He will reign for a thousand years. So, so what am I trying to bring out? If I don't know what's happening in these world events or things that have happened, I may not be able to interpret scriptures and teach the scriptures in the right way. I mean, I, I can teach it, but it may not be as effective it, as it should be. Right? Look at uh, the Old Testament. Right? If you do a, a study of the Old Testament, and it's, it's wonderful to see the prophets. And why God sent those prophets? Why is he sending a set of prophets to, north, uh, to the north of Israel, some of them to the south? Why did he send people from the south to go to north? If you look at the history of the difference between the people in the north of Israel and the south of Israel, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's so wonderfully portrayed in the Old Testament. But if we have a mind saying, oh, Old Testament, there's so much supporting, so we're not going to be able to effectively teach it. Right? Uh, so look at history. Look at what uh, the 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 nation of Israel. What what does it stand for, or or the the people? What do they do, right? The cultures, the background, right? Uh, uh, and and why is it so important? You know, even uh, I was reading about um, I forget that the the sycamore tree it had so much of uh, you know uh, there's so much of value to that tree all through the Old Testament. Right. Uh, so, what's it about the tree, the sycamore tree? Why is God? Why is God so fascinated about that tree? Or, you know, you when you do these researches, we can either look at it in, you know, just look at it, read it, and walk past it, or we can develop a passion. And say, I want to know more about this. I want to go deeper. I want to learn more. Right. So it's a choice that you and I can make. Now we have a fifty-minute session, right? Uh, we can present, we can just say, okay, this is what it is as a teacher. But it's our responsibility to go back to the word and begin to read it, begin to really do research. And, you know, now it's such a wonderful time that we are living in where, you know, you just in the tap of a button, you get all information, whatever information you want, you get it on Google, right? You, you've got you know, hundreds of commentaries and resources that are available, books that are available. Um, so develop this passion to read. It, uh, one of the things I do is I make it a point that I read at least two books in two weeks. Right. So now it's not like a target, but I like to read. Right, right now I'm reading the book Find, Fulfill, and Follow by Andrew Womack. Uh, and it's a wonderful book. Right. Sometimes when we read, no, we, we may not even understand. And we'll think, hey, I knew it all this while, but I didn't think of it this way. You know, uh, and let me give you this example. In the book, Find, Fulfill, and Follow, Andrew Womack's book, uh, there's a passage there talking about how do we find our calling and how God finds us through these seasons. And he's talking about Moses, right? And he so beautifully writes this, right? I'm sure you know it. I'm sure I, uh, you know, I knew it, but I never thought of it this way. But right? every time there were there was a world leaders, great leaders coming into this world, the enemy tried to kill them. Moses, right? Uh, Egypt, they, they, you know, the Pharaoh says, "Kill every firstborn." Somehow, you know, Moses' mother. We know the story, right? Put him in a basket, sent him away. 
and God protected him and he was raised up in the palace. And to Jesus, kill every male child. Right? So every time there was two prominent, powerful leaders coming into this world, the enemy tried his best to stop that. Now when I read it, I said, I mean, it, it sounds so simple, right? Uh, uh, you may think, hey, how come you didn't think of that? But I didn't. But but if I think of it, yeah, right. And so there's so much that you know we can, you know, learn and and, I, and develop things. Uh, and when we do this, you know, it's just going to empower us. It's going to, right? We're not doing God a favor, right? By developing a passion for knowledge, it's we are getting closer to Him, right? A teacher has a passion for knowledge of spiritual matters. He's hungry to know the why, the where, the what, and the how. Why, where, what, and how. Right? He's hungry to know that. Why did... Have you ever thought of this? Why did God tell Abraham, you know, the people of Israel are going to go into... Uh, you know, 400 years of bondage. Right. W what was it? Why, why did... And what were they doing in bondage? What were they doing in Egypt? Right? W and, and when you think of it, why were they there? And how did they end up, you know, living their life in those 400 years? Now, what was the outcome of this? Why did... You see, the moment Moses had, uh, you know, killed the Egyptian and he ran away, uh, what was, you know, uh, everything changed. The dynamics changed. And I'm just giving the example of Moses, but there's so much, right? Um, and you look at, uh, look at even uh, the New Testament, look at the book of uh, Acts and you read it, it's so powerful, right? It's so wonderful. Or look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, right? Why, do you, why did God, make Jesus wait for 30 years. Right? Didn't he start off when he was in his early 20s? And then you ask these questions to yourself. You try to understand. And and and, and that's where you, you know, you're hungry for God. And all of this, now we must be very careful. All of this learning must take us closer to God. Because there are many times these too much of learning will cause us to ask too many questions. Remember that some questions are best left for God to answer. Right. Somebody came up to me and said, uh, Jesus said we're preparing the mansions in heaven. Has he started preparing? Now, that I don't know. Right. I, I can't say he's already started preparing or he's not started. That I don't know. But he says, don't you know that there will be mansions for you up in heaven? So it's going to be there. How and when he's going to start now, that I don't know. But there are certain things that we have that we can study, that we can really dig deep. And, you know, I was fascinated by this whole thing of, you know, how Jesus, um, I learned this maybe a couple of years ago, but I was fascinated about, you know, when I read it, my, I was so excited. You know, the whole thing of how why Jesus rose up from when he rose up from the dead, why did he you know cover the fold the cloth and keep it there? And you know, it's so amazing to see that everything the Lord God does, the Lord Jesus and how God does things, there's a reason for it. Right? And so our knowledge is just a drop in the ocean. Uh, we can continue to acquire more and more of it. Here's a very, very important point. You know, as teachers and, and uh, you know, students of the Word of God, we go on, we study, 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 and there'll come a time when we are very uh, affluent with the things of the Word of God, right? We just know where our scriptures, where our, what does it mean, what they're saying. Maintain a humble heart because it, we should not let all of that knowledge go up to pride, right? I always say this to myself personally. I say pride goes before the fall. So the more 
I study, learn, the more I should humble myself, the more I should say, God, whatever I'm learning, let it be useful for my life, let it be useful for the people that we are ministering to. Maintain a humble heart. There's no point of learning all of this and then we walk in pride. Right? We, we, it'll, it's, it's of no use. Let's read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. First Corinthians chapter eight, one and two. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse one and two. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Jafina. So knowledge puffs up now let me bring a context of what paul is saying here right the church in corinth have intellectuals in the church right and there's a problem here now what is the problem there are people believers who are having food sacrificed to idols and this is affecting the new believers who are coming into christ right and what is happening is the people are saying, no, that's okay. It, it doesn't matter, right? So Paul is saying, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Now, the reason you are doing this is because you know if you that an idol is nothing and the food uh, and, and God is greater than all of it, and you are grown up to that place, place of maturity, you know it. Your knowledge has, you have the knowledge of it. Right, you know who your God is. Yet, knowledge, this knowledge has puffed you up in such a way that it's okay to see a fellow believer fall because of this matter. And if you go later on uh, in verse 10, I think he talks about uh, how our food does not bring us close to God, nor does it bring us, take us away from God. Right? Uh, and so he's trying to tell them, you, you all have knowledge of it. But you're not maintaining a humble heart. So Paul goes on and he says, if if my brother or my sister in Christ is, if it's making him or her uh, ask questions or to deny the faith, I would rather not eat it. Right. So so this is a huge topic. But but what's he trying to say? Don't let your knowledge bring people to a place of doubt and fear, or to a place of you know feeling insecure. That's what's happened here, because remember the they're all most of them were were there was a goddess named Aphrodite in Corinth, and they were worshiping that idol. Now they've suddenly they accept the Lord Jesus, and maybe somebody has shared the gospel. They come into the church, so they don't know anything. And if they see somebody, hey, this leader of the church is eating food sacrificed to the idols, which you know probably we've done in our temple there in Aphrodite. It's affecting them. It's affecting their walk with God. And these leaders are saying, it's all right, no problem. Uh, you know, God is bigger than all of it. And they're puffed up. So he goes on and he says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. If you really, <clears throat> if you really had love for that person, that believer, you would have stopped what you're doing just so that this person can you know, continue to walk with Christ. So maintaining a humble heart is the key of, of you know, being the, doing the ministry of a teacher. The more we read, it is obvious the more we will grow, right? It's not like we're going to read and stay on the same level. All of us, right? When you joined here on your first year, first semester, it is obvious that you have grown in maturity. You have learned over these you know, one and a half odd years, you have learnt, right? You're not on the same level yet. You know, it should be a place where we are humble. We are saying, God, help me to maintain this humble heart. Even as I learn, even as I go into third year, even as a, even if I plan to do my higher studies, learn more about the Hebrew, the Greek, and all of those things. It's wonderful. Nothing wrong about gaining knowledge, but it's important that knowledge and humility are summed up together right and and we could see that in jesus right 
there were times he was very intellectual there were times he said he didn't have to prove his intellectual his wisdom he didn't have to prove it he just just work miracles or he just blessed people and uh, that's the key here right uh, maintain a humble heart pursue knowledge maintain a humble heart walk in love right so let's look at a few points here develop a wide range of topics right now there are plenty of topics we can study on you know uh, something that you know i'm just going to share some of the things that i love to read is uh, uh you know and and continue to learn is like hermeneutics i love to understand scripture and bring it uh you know to interpret it the right way because the moment i interpret it the wrong way uh uh, i may put across a wrong message so how many it's something that i really love uh word study uh uh in a character study passage study so what i do is uh, now this is just an example right you don't have to do this uh but these are things that i've done and i continue to do so in my bible um uh, so i've taken up letters right so the letter of romans or uh, romans first second corinthians so all of paul's epistles I've done a word study, right? And I continue to do that every now and then. So I, I mark with different colors, right? So the word grace is probably in my Bible, it's yellow. And uh, there's, there's love, which is green. And there's righteousness, which is red, right? And so when you look at my Bible, it's all, you know, I know I've done a word study. So I know, okay. Uh, so I know in the book of Romans, you'll find more of the red because righteousness is there all throughout the scriptures all throughout the letter of rome rome uh, romans right so so you can do word studies right you can do character studies right? you know, character studies take up a character research study look at their look at the things that they've done look at what how, where they've been successful where they have failed right and and apply it in your own life right look at examples like joseph right uh, what happened to him right uh, and and learn from their lives right he he was a wonderful boy but he didn't have to you know uh, continue to keep going and telling his brother see this is what this is what happened but he was a kid he didn't he was just you know wanting to go to his brother so what are the things that we learn right even though he was sold off he there was no bitterness in him and we see in the end he grew to such a maturity he forgave them uh, god elevated him look at david right? uh, at a young age he knew it yet he was running for his life became the king what happened he sinned um, uh, and then he, he lost his son and so all these things right we can we can study about them the apostle paul and the lord jesus himself so doing character studies then you got passage studies right uh, you can talk about passages in the scriptures uh well, i remember when i was in uh, bible college i did this whole passage study on, and we had to you know come in front and share what we have learned and it was wonderful i remember doing the whole thing of uh, you know um uh, elijah and uh, at at mount carmel what happened right against those uh, 800 prophets of asarod and doing a whole study and so i studied about asarod what are they what what is the uh, you know what what is their belief system uh, i think it was 400 asarod and 400 of, of baal uh, uh, and so so what are they what do they believe in what is their god uh why was elijah so upset what made him to come up with this whole uh you know challenge uh, up on that mountain and uh you know so it, it is wonderful so you do those passage studies you apply it in your own life right then some of the things i enjoy right now is to i'm, I'm starting on on dreams and interpretation of dreams i i really enjoy that visions dreams and how God can speak to us through these visions and dreams, uh, how uh, even through the book of Revelations, God speaks through allegories, Old Testament as well, New Testament as well, he speaks through allegories, right? Uh, you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Uh, it's an allegory, right? Uh, and so uh, just if I get a dream, how can I 
go back? How can I interpret the scripture in the right way? Uh, uh, and there's a lot of material, right? Online, you can listen to sermons, listen to podcasts, um, lots and lots of materials that's available online. So develop a wide range of topics, right? Uh, there may be some topics that you may be really interested in, so you can spend more time and you feel you're called for that. So for example, if you feel you're called to be a worship leader, you can spend more time studying about praise and worship and uh, how God instituted it. What are the ways of, if you feel your calling is a um, you know, pastor, so, you know, study about that as well. So there are certain things that will really draw us close, but uh, we must take that step to develop uh, an interest to learn things that we may not really be interested in. Right, uh, so I can't say I'm not interested in dreams and visions, or I'm not interested in the prophetic. So I'll just hold. No, uh, we must develop that interest. Right, uh, learn about it, see, watch people, ask questions. Right, um, and you know, I remember growing up. Uh, uh, once I became a believer, I used to ask a lot of questions. Right, some of them were very silly. I even ask a lot of questions now. Uh, but some of them are very silly questions, but I want to understand it, right? It's all right to ask questions. It's all right to, you know, even if it's something very simple, it's all right just to get a good understanding of what your uh, what your understanding is, right? So next point, question, inquire, investigate, and search, right? Investigate, search, go online, and, uh, you know, uh, I remember when I used to study the word, I used to have these, you know, two, three Bibles, and then I had to go from here to there to there, and then check, okay, what does this mean? And and uh, it was hard, right? It was hard. Uh, but I enjoyed doing it. But now, of course, I I do have those Bibles. I do look up, look it up every now and then, but I just see what's easier. Just go to Google, say commentary, put the verse down, and there are plenty of commentaries available to see what what it means different views that people have uh interpreted the right way and right uh inquire investigate search research learn unlearn uh, so all of this is included now keep it simple develop the ability to make the complex simple. Now, this is a very important task of a teacher, right? Keeping it simple, right? You know, for example, apologetics or the series that we're doing, Faith and Science, now, right? Uh, there's there's a lot of material involved, right? Um, there's a lot of science. Yet we must make it in a way we and I feel it is. You know, uh, uh, it's a way where we are able to make those complex things simple, right? And we must be able to do that in everything that we study, right? There are some things which will be complex, but try to break it down. And so I remember, uh, you know, Leviticus, I, I didn't want to read it for many years. I didn't want to read it, right? Uh, it, it just for me, it was too much, right? But I realized I have to read it. I have to study it so that I can, you know, teach it. And uh, Old Testament survey is something I've been teaching for quite some time, and I wanted to learn it. Right. So we must develop that ability to like, make it simple, right, uh, as much as possible. But while we are making it simple, we must be sure that we don't divert from the truth just so that we make people understand. The truth is the truth, right? Uh, we must not, you know, twist the gospel. We must not, you know, uh, give half the gospel or half the message that we're trying to say. Give it in a way that is simple and easily understood, right? Now, this comes over time, right? Uh, as we keep teaching, as we keep learning, uh, it'll come over time, right? Keep revelation fresh. And stay fresh in the word, right? This is very, very important. Keeping revelation fresh, right? Uh, sometimes we may 
especially when we're reading the word and we're reading it with the mindset that I already know this, uh, very unlikely that we may receive a revelation out of it, right? But keep it fresh, right? Keep keep reminding yourself of the previous revelations that you had in God's word and the previous ways that God ministered to you and then continue to pursue for newer and fresher revelations of God, right? Uh, uh, we must do that. We must do that. As, uh, and we establish the fact that as a teacher, we must be reading the word of God. Right? We can't say, uh, right, uh, I read one chapter today, uh, so I've done my part. Uh, maybe if you're very busy and you've got to go to work, that's all right. But, uh, but if you feel you want to be a teacher, you really want to get into God's word, you want revelations, we must spend time in God's presence. We must, right? in the sense that we must be willing to go dig deeper, study deeper. Right? Uh, picture this, right? I remember this verse, Acts 1.8. Now you will receive power to be a witness. I read it, uh, I think, thousands of times. But all of a sudden, one day, I was just reading, and I read the same verse in a commentary. And the commentary said, the Greek word for witness is martyr. And I'm sure I've used this before, but these are things that will stick to me till the end of my life. Right? Because it's a revelation. It's, it's, it's there in the spirit. It's not here, up here only. It's in the spirit. Right? So I read that, and I said, so God has poured out His Spirit upon us that we may be, you will receive power to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. That's what the verse really means. The word witness, Greek is martyr. So that means God will pour out His Spirit on us that even if it comes to a place of being martyred for Christ, we will be willing to go through it because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that verse, Acts 1.8, is so different to what we read it here. And so you can translate the same thing. Witness, everywhere there's witness. Jesus said, no, you'll be my witness. It's all martyr, the Greek. Of course, in some places, he also meant to, uh, to, you know, to uh, witnesses, to, to, to show Jesus to people, right? Uh, or to be ministers of the gospel. But the Greek there in Acts 1 8 means martyr. Right? And so there are plenty of things it's the same way, right? We we get revelations and you got to keep it fresh, stay fresh in the word of God. Right? Uh, I've been reading about Jeremiah and uh, and how this God uses this insignificant man who says, I can't speak, I can't. I'm a weak person. Uh, but if you look at once his ministry started, there are portions, I think, it's, I forget the chapters, but uh, there are portions where he's he's rebuking the Israelites and he's, and he's telling them, see, you people are worshipping idols. And he's giving this whole list of how those idols are made. The same man who was fearful, right? who said, don't call me, don't choose me, I don't want to do what you want, what you he's saying, you know, you go into the forest, you cut a tree, you take the wood, you make a shape out of the wood, then you put a, uh, you know, you decorate that shape, and then you put all kinds of ornaments on it, then you put it on your shoulders, and it needs to be carried around. You can't even carry it by yourself. Uh, it can't even talk. It it has eyes. It can't see. It has ears. It can't hear. It has a mouth. It can't speak. And you people are bowing down before this. Uh, it's defiling. You're defiling what God has done, and He's rebuking them. And they, uh, and and it's really stern message. But through all of that, He comes to uh, Jeremiah 26, 27, 28. He's saying, "Okay, even though you're like this, God has a plan for you. God will restore you all." That's why Jeremiah 29:11 comes. Right? I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, to give you good hope and a good future. Right. You're right now in bondage. You're staying in. You're 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 in you're you're in captive right now, uh, under the Babylonian rule. But there will come a time 
if you turn away from your your, your your the things that you're doing that are detestable in God's eyes, you turn away from it. I have plans for you, right? Now we can't take I have plans to prosper you, give you a good hope and a good future just like that. You need to see the context, right? I can't keep living a sinful life and say, God, you said you have plans for me to prosper me. Yes, that's his plan, but he's also saying, look at context of Jeremiah. He's telling the, the people, the Israelites, you first turn away and you see the plans God has for you. Right? So there's so much uh, that we can study and learn. Keep uh, revelation fresh. Keep, keep staying in the word of God. Practice before you teach. Now, I'm guilty of not doing this at times, right? Uh, but it's a good habit, right? Uh, initially, um, I, I used to practice a lot. Right? Personally, I used to practice. Uh, there are times, you know, even when we are doing sessions for uh, now, uh, you know, uh, in, not only in Bible college, but in different places, uh, I practice. Right? Whether it's recording for anything or whether it's for uh, the students and colleges, practice. Now, practice, what does it help us? You know, when, when it comes to practice, it involves, I would say it involves two things, right? One is being materially pre uh, prepared, right? So you have your material, you have your points, you have your examples, you have your, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bible verses, you have everything. Right? You prepare it, right? You prepare it in the right way and you have it probably have a PPT or you have the notes available. You yourself, you either have a physical note or you have a, uh, you know, a device, a laptop or a phone and then you practice it. How are you going to hold it? How are you going to stand? How are you going to, you know, just, just how are you going to start off by teaching? Um, and I think, you know, last time we were talking, uh, uh, in, a, in a couple of meetings we had, we said the first 10 seconds in delivering a, a, a message is very important. Right? The first 10 seconds is important. So how are you going to start off? How are you going to... Now, it's not always the first 10 seconds, but you get the... You, you, know, you grip the audience that you're speaking to in those first 10, 15 seconds. I'm sure all of us open YouTube and you get those ads. You wait for the skip, and right, this is just uh, something. Right? So, same thing. You, this 10, 15 seconds, the initial first 10, 15 seconds, very important. So, you you practice how you're going to start off, how you're going to, uh, you know, begin the teaching. Are you going to begin it with a story or begin? Uh, how how do you plan with a verse, or you're going to explain something that happened, and then how are you going to summarize the whole thing? I'm sure you've learned all of this in homiletics as well. Uh, uh, you know, uh, how are you going to end it? What what is the context you're going to end on? How are you going to help the listeners to apply uh, what they have heard? Right. Uh, so you can practice. Nothing wrong in practicing. Right. I got plenty of uh, sermons that you know uh, that that I have. I keep practicing it. I mean, the series that's going right now. Whenever I get the opportunity to share, uh, I practice it. Right. Because I know it's not an easy sermon. I have to practice it. Uh, and same goes with teaching, preaching, everything, right? And lastly, be teachable. There will a good teacher is always teachable, right? Uh, a good teacher is always in a place of being teachable, right? So never must a teacher say, "Okay, I know all this, so it's all right." No, good teacher. Is teachable, right? So, so it's important to come to a place where we can, you know, continue to receive from our leaders, from our pastors, from people that we know, right? It could be somebody who is, you know, just a believer in Christ, you know, just serving in the church, and they may want to share something with you. Uh, it is very important that we don't look down on them and say, "Hey, you know what? I'm teaching for five or ten years and." Uh, and I've been doing this and this and this. This is what I know. Uh, that would be the wrong stance to take. If somebody is sharing something, we may know it. It's all right to hear it from them. And it's all right. And then if you feel you can add your inputs, or, or even if it's the same thing 
and you already know it, God can speak to you in a different way. Right? God can speak to you in a different way. In that same thing that you already know. Right? So be teachable. People may say, you know, after preaching or teaching, people may come up in, to you and say, uh, you know, I feel this is what, what you said is not right. It's not making sense. Or this is what I feel about it. It's okay. Right? Be teachable. You you tell them, hey, why don't we discuss about it? Right? The wrong stance to take is you're telling me. Right? You're telling me, you know, how many hours I spent uh, studying this. That's the wrong stance to take. Right? So being teachable, again, is uh, requires a humble heart, requires you know a heart of just saying, God, I want to learn more. And God can use anyone to speak and minister to us. Right, so with this, we complete the ministry of the evangelist and the ministry of the teacher. Right, so let's take a break and uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 10 o'clock and we'll just spend some time uh, uh, just discussing some more. Right, let's take a break and come back. Any questions? Uh, probably we can come back and take questions. If you have questions, you can also put it on the chat. And then we can discuss about it next class. Right, let's take a break. Thank you. <laughs> 